you know, Center for Transportation. This is one of nearly a hundred Infrastructure Week events taking place all across the country. As we begin, I want to mention the testimony of Transportation Secretary Elaine Chow before the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee yesterday. She introduced, again, the administration's infrastructure plan, beginning with these words. The President has made clear that modernizing our country, country's crumbling infrastructure, including our nation's highways and bridges, is one of his top priorities. The administration's infrastructure pro uh, initiative will be comprehensive, covering surface transportation and aviation, along with other important sectors like ports, inland waterways, pipelines, water, broadband, and energy as well. I'd like to highlight three important points in Secretary Chow's statement. One, she mentioned long-term reforms on how infrastructure projects are regulated. Two, she mentioned leveraging federal dollars by incentivizing state, local, and non-federal investment in infrastructure. And three, she said the administration hopes to broaden and expand participation in infrastructure funding so that more projects can be undertaken overall. Now, Congress could help advance all of these objectives by lifting the ban on tolling interstate highways. Let's take a step back. Why are we talking about tolling? What's the significance of tolling in America? Well, with gas taxes being ubiquitous, it's easier for some people to forget that toll roads represented one of the first ways to pay for roads in this country, and it goes back to colonial days. But tolling predates the United States and every modern country in our world today. When we look back in history, we can see that people have been using toll roads for at least 2,700 years because tolls were paid on the Susa Babylon Highway during the reign of Assurbanipal in the 7th century BC in what is now modern day Iran and Iraq. Coming up to the present, here in the US, we have toll roads in 35 states and Puerto Rico. 37 states have laws authorizing the use of public private partnerships for infrastructure funding. The nearly 6,000 miles of toll facilities in America generate about $15 billion in toll revenues each year. Toll revenues lessen the burden on state transportation budgets and allow them to spend their limited ta gas tax revenues on other projects. It's also important to note that tolling is exceptionally effective as a project financing tool and less so for program financing. There are nearly 16 million trips taken every day on toll facilities in the United States. 16 million, that's a big number. Let's put that in perspective. Think about the Los Angeles Dodgers, which constantly leads Major League Baseball in total game attendance. Now, I know we have some Red Sox and Yankees fans here, but we'll set that to the side for the minute. 16 million is more than the total attendance at all Major League Baseball games at Dodger Stadium in the last four years. That's a lot of people. And that's what we see every day on America's toll roads and bridges. Now, the interstate system is a special case. For the most part, with very few exceptions, tolling is prohibited on the interstate system. This prohibition dates back to the Federal Road Act of 1916. And yet the first 2,100 miles of interstate highways were toll roads that were grandfathered into the system. You'll hear more about that from Jeff Davis and Emil Frankel in a few minutes. We at IBTTA have been advocating for years that Congress should lift the ban on tolling interstate highways, and they should do it specifically to help pay for rebuilding those interstate highways, some of which are more than 50 years old. Now, different people have different visions about what this would look like. Some people think that we would see an interstate system clogged with gates, barriers, and toll plazas that would force vehicles to stop every 10 miles or so to pay a toll. That is a dystopian vision that would never happen because that's not how tolling systems work today. I, on the other hand, envision free-flowing traffic on a reinvigorated and rebuilt interstate highway system that is paid for using a funding method chosen by the individual states. 
If a state chooses, at its discretion, to use tax dollars to rebuild its interstate highways, that's fine. And if another state decides to use tolls to rebuild its interstate highways, that's fine too. Such a state would most likely use electronic tolling so that it would be collecting tolls from vehicles traveling at highway speeds without gates, barriers, or toll plaza. If you remember nothing else about what I say today, I want you to remember this. Congress can help realize the infrastructure plan outlined by Secretary Chow by lifting the prohibition on tolling interstate highways. Congress should give the states the ability to toll their interstate highways specifically to rebuild them. Let the states have access to another tool in the toolbox. This isn't a mandate. No state would be required to toll their interstates. This simply gives states an option, the flexibility to choose tolling, if it makes sense to them. Now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Rob Puentes of the Eno Center for Transportation. Rob and I have a long association both in his current job and in former roles in Washington, D.C. I admire Rob for his clear, supple thinking and the beautiful ways in which he expresses himself. Rob, you have the floor. Great. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, thank you all for tuning in today, and thank you to IBTTA for uh, co-sponsoring this, this event with us. It's really interesting and, and very timely to be talking about this now. And it's, it's actually interesting that it's timely because, as Jeff Davis and others will tell you, we've been talking about tolls in this country for a very, very long time. Uh, it's actually something that Eno has been involved with for, for quite a while. In fact, it was about three and a half years ago uh, where Eno and IBTTA and the American Trucking Association had a, uh, had a policy debate, quite frankly, to talk about these issues, to lay everything out on the table. It was before my time at, at Eno, but I went back and watched the video and I was struck by both uh, how much things were exactly the same and how dramatically things were, were very, very different just three and a half years ago. I mean, clearly there are issues that are still the same. Um, as we talked about, tolls don't really work um, for a lot of parts of the country, particularly in rural areas, um, and they're mostly applicable for high-density kind of urban places. That clearly hasn't changed. Um, tolls can also hit low-income households disproportionately hard because there's no kinds of means test, so most folks would generally be paying the same across their income level. That really hasn't changed. Uh, we know the trucking industry is still operating at, at pretty thin margins, and to avoid paying tolls, they may switch to kind of parallel routes or quote-unquote free roads off of, the, uh, off of the toll lanes. Tolls like those fees are still not popular, um, uh, and adding tolls to lanes that are currently untold is particularly so. And of course, we still have all the ongoing issues with the solvency of the Highway Trust Fund. Passed the bill a few years ago um, to give us some time, but clearly those issues around federal funding and the state of the interstate system uh, are, are still very prevalent. But in addition to those things, there are a lot of new elements to the debate that make it really timely to talk about right now. As Pat mentioned, the Trump administration is talking about a trillion dollar infrastructure package. Exactly how that comes together is still to be seen. We don't have a lot of those details yet. But for transportation, uh, again, as Pat mentioned, Secretary Chow has all but promised the package will include the use of public-private partnerships for new investments, and she's also said that toll roads will probably be, will probably be a key part of that. Again, we still don't have any details, but that's been very clear from them. It's not exactly synonymous with the issue of tolling the interstates necessarily, but the administration has also talked about reducing the federal government's role on a range of policy areas and removing the restrictions seem to seemingly be right in line with those administration priorities to get the government out of some areas of transportation. What also appears to be new are proposals like in Rhode Island to impose trolls, to impose tolls just on trucks, uh, and then use that money for the rehabilitation of state bridges. I think there's only one place in the country, I think the New York Thruway Authority is the only one um, that operates a toll focused solely on trucks, but that dates back a number of years. But I think this is something that more and more states seem to be talking about, obviously something that's strongly opposed uh, by the trucking industry. Cities also appear to be interested in new tools to manage congestion, especially on the highways that cut right through the center of these, of these cities and really function more like main streets uh, than inner cities. Uh, the purpose and the, the function of these roads has changed over time, and cities are looking to all kinds of different tools to manage congestion and rehabilitate those roads, particularly those that are right there within the middle of these center cities. The last thing that appears to be different is that public attitudes may be changing. There's lots of different studies that show about Americans' willingness to pay for all kinds of things on transportation, 
but we found an academic study a few months ago that asked drivers' views on five possible revenue sources, and more than a third said they would go along with greater reliance on tolls, which was higher than the uh, rest of the responses for fuels taxes, for new mileage fees, um, or for income taxes. So things are changing. Um, there are things that I have stayed the same, but um, this all still very much matters today. We know it's hugely complicated. We know this is very controversial, and clearly uh, it's ever-changing along with the infrastructure that we're dealing with every day. So let me go ahead and turn it over now to my Eno colleagues for some additional perspectives. We'll start with Jeff Davis. He's a senior fellow at Eno and the editor of the esteemed Eno Transportation Weekly. Jeff has probably done more work on the history of tolls and, and best practices than anybody around, so um, we'll certainly hear from, from him on that. And then following Jeff is Evil Frankel, the former commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Transportation, also a senior fellow at Eno. He was assistant secretary for transportation policy at the U.S. Department of Transportation from 2002 to 2005 under President Bush, and can talk about his experience with tolling both on the federal level with the pilots they initiated uh, and on the state level as well. So let me turn it over to Jeff to kick us off. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, going back and looking at the history of the federal restrictions on tolling the interstates, it's very important to know that there's actually no specific restriction on tolling interstate. It's not a 1956 debate. This goes back to the original Federal Aid Road Act of 1916, which was the first federal aid for general state road building. Uh, and it was brought about at a time when the toll turnpike system of the 19th century had largely failed. Uh, there was the, the, that was the whole point of the need for a federal program to some extent, was the fact that a lot of the original toll turnpikes from the 1800s had become somewhat dilapidated. Uh, but Congress decided to start a new program uh, to give aids to states for road building in 1916. Senator Jacob Gallinger from New Hampshire got an amendment passed in the Senate that said all roads constructed under the provisions of this act shall be free from tolls of all kinds. That's still in law today, 23 U.S.C. 301. Uh, and so there was, it was not considered particularly controversial at the time that that, uh, that provision passed with large support in the House and Senate. Uh, but it's also important to know that Historically and constitutionally, roads were a very different thing than bridges and tunnels. Bridges and tunnels historically were viewed as only local concerns. The only federal role in bridges or tunnels for most of American history was getting a permit from the federal government to certify that the bridge would not interfere with waterborne commerce on a navigable waterway, because that was the federal role of interstate commerce on waterways. The bridges were just uh, a coincidence. And so in 1927, you had the first carve out from the ban on federal aid to states for, for toll roads uh, started to be uh, on a carve out for uh, building toll bridges and tunnels on fe to federal aid roads on the condition that once the construction cost was paid off, the toll would have to come off. And so that, that uh, exception has, been, has uh, grown a little bit over the years. Uh, in 1939, Franklin Roosevelt had a vision of a network of cross-country highways. He actually brought Chief McDonald of the Bureau of Public Roads in and got an FDUS and wrote in blue pencil his FDR's idea for three east-west highways and three north-south highways and told Chief McDonald to go study it. And they reported uh, a landmark report in 1939 called Toll Roads and Free Roads, where the Bureau of Public Roads for the first time basically rejected the concept of cross-country toll roads, uh, saying that they didn't believe they'd be financially feasible. And uh, some of the ridership assumptions they were using were kind of overturned later when the Pennsylvania Turnpike proved a success. But for the most part, the, uh, the federal policy on the tolling of cross-country roads has never really recovered from that 1939 decision. Uh, when Dwight Eisenhower took office in 1953, he had visions of using tolls to finance the system of cross-country highways he wanted to build. Uh, but the committee he appointed, headed by General Lucius Clay, wound up rejecting that. Clay told White House staff there were three reasons why they turned down the, the concept of tolling the interstates. One was that there would be a lot of political furor if tolls varied between states. Two, that many states would reject tolling out of hand because of, and might oppose the entire road program. And C, he thought the politics of tolling were so bad in Congress that he didn't want to endorse a plan that would be, quote, whipped, unquote, uh, before it got started. But uh, as Patrick said, there were exemptions on the original 1956 interstate map to grandfather existing toll roads into the interstate system. That's why the Pennsylvania Turnpike, for example, is 
part of the interstate system. It was built before 1956, but was grandfathered in. Um, but again, we still have the original 1916 toll provision in law that, that prohibits the tolling of a highway if it was built with federal aid money at any time. Uh, we have seen over the years a few more and more targeted temporary or pilot exemptions to the general ban. Uh, 1991, uh, the, what's now the Value Pricing Pilot Program was put into effect to allow tolling in terms of it says just for congestion pricing, not for construction or reconstruction costs. And in 1998, Congress approved a pilot program to allow three states to do interstate reconstruction toll based. But because the politics of tolling are so complicated and, and in some ways negative, uh, it's 19 years later, none of those three uh, pilots have been actually been exercised yet. So we're still waiting to see if any state will be able to get the internal politics in order to take advantage of that. Uh, and Emil's going to talk some about, about how these uh, these pilot programs and other specific exemptions from the tolling ban have, have worked out in practice. But in general, you have to take a look back at, at what the social compact was here. Uh, because right now, the fact that the federal government paid $5,000 a mile to pay guys with shovels to build a road in 1917 means that that road is still cannot be told today. Uh, and part of the, and the problem here, I think, is a more systemic problem of the, the whole concept of federal grants in A, in that there is no federal highway program unless you're talking about roads on public lands or forests. There's a federal aid highway program. The federal government writes checks to states and subsidizes state road building and road reconstruction. Those assets belong to the states, not the federal government. Uh, so you can't, that's one of the reasons you can't have a real capital budget at the federal level that involves these programs, because your capital budget involves the concept of depreciating an asset over its useful life. And these aren't federal assets, the federal government can't depreciate them. But because the federal government pays 80, 90% of the bills, most states really don't have the concept of depreciating those assets either, because they didn't pay the money to build those assets. So, you're in, the, in this never never land because uh, if you actually, if someone was actually in charge of considering roads as depreciable assets so that the cost of reconstructing a road after the end of its useful life is basically the same, similar to buying a new asset, then you would uh, have to also consider the problem of the tolling ban saying that because you know, someone paid $5,000 a mile to build this road in 1917. It's the same asset as was built in 1917 instead of a depreciated old new asset. So no matter what happens with the tolling debate, I think it would behoove the program uh, to have some more discussion of, of looking at should somebody be depreciating these assets and should we view roads, bridges, and tunnels, et cetera, as assets that depreciate over time and then expire and the reconstruction being a new, basically a new asset instead of the old. So, uh, you know, Thanks, Jeff. And um, I just want to pick up on Jeff's comments uh, about really beginning with ice tea in the early 1990s, we've seen what I would describe as some slight erosion of the flat prohibition on tolling federal aid highways, but federal aid roads, specifically <clears throat> including the interstate highway system. Uh, Jeff mentioned the pilot programs that were enacted through the 1990s. Um, and what you've seen actually uh, since then, uh, most recently in both MAP21 and FAST Act, is um, further um, development, expansion of uh, the pilot programs. And uh, one of those pilot programs, the so-called value pricing pilot program, originally the congestion pricing pilot program, has 15 states, and those slots are all filled. Um, there's also been some uh, modest um, modifications, if you will, of the general prohibition itself. Uh, so uh, little by little, there has been, uh, uh, I think, an understanding of um, and more support for the idea of moving away uh, from the prohibition on tolling the federal aid system. Um, when I was uh, at uh, U.S. Department of Transportation under the President George W. Bush, uh, we in fact uh, made as part of our proposed author reauthorization bill what became Safety Lou, a specific provision that would have eliminated the, the prohibition entirely. 
Uh, and I think probably some discussion of our reasoning in that might be instructive uh, to this discussion, which we're which we're raising today and, and will continue, I'm sure, in one form or another. Um, I think uh, there was a strong sense, certainly within our administration, that uh, removing the prohibition was consistent with principles of federalism. As Jeff has mentioned and as our audience certainly knows, um, these are state-owned assets. Uh, the federal role is to give grants and in some ways to obviously, importantly, to regulate and create greater uniformity and reciprocity across state lines. But these are state assets. They have the burden of operating, maintaining, and rebuilding, albeit with federal assistance in many cases, uh, these assets, these roads, bridges, tunnels. Um, and uh, I think certainly we saw, although the provision I, I should note was not contained in the final version of uh, safety lieu, uh, we saw this as removing uh, federal bar a federal barrier, a significant federal barrier to state initiatives. As Pat mentioned in his introductory remarks, uh, this uh, move to eliminate the prohibition was perceived as permissive. It was not mandatory. It was not prescriptive. It in no way uh, required states to utilize tolling, uh, particularly in the urbanized uh, in highways, interstate highways, and urbanized metropolitan regions, but it would allow the states, uh, as Pat put it, to use this tool if they wanted to. And Garrett Ippolito, in just a moment, will talk a little bit about my state and his Connecticut, uh, where there's been an ongoing discussion over the last 20 or 30 years about uh, the use of tolling. It remains, as Rob said, very controversial in many states where tolls are not used on the interstate system. But well, from our perspective, in the Bush administration, uh, it was seen, as I said, as a, as a way to allow states to exercise their initiative, to make choices. Uh, and it seems to me that with that something that's been happening, certainly progressively, as we all know, over the last 10 or more years, is a, a shifting of the burden to rebuild the interstate highway system to states. I think we can anticipate, we don't know, but we can anticipate that President Trump's uh, $1 trillion infrastructure initiative from all the comments being made by Secretary Chow and others is going to contain a very strong element of private investment, at least in transportation facilities and networks, using federal funds to leverage private investment. Well, that's another way, and. Uh, and, you know, uh, that's something understandable and, and something with broad support, but it is another way of shifting the burden of funding to, uh, to the states and localities, to users of the systems, because private uh, investment or loans uh, need to be, loans need to be serviced, private investment needs to uh, have returns, which means that the states, if they're going to take advantage of uh, fully of, of uh, federal programs and private investments if they are going to be an important part of this new and expanded program, uh, will have to develop new revenue streams. They do not need necessarily to be tolls, but certainly tolls uh, should, should be an, and can be considered as a possible revenue stream to leverage the private investment, which is going to be a very, very substantial portion of the $1 trillion program. So uh, I think that's another reason for looking hard at the impact of the prohibition on tolling, as, as Jeff and others have pointed out, going back to 1916, but how relevant it is to where we are today in terms of the needs of our transportation infrastructure and how the burdens are being shared, the funding burdens are being shared. So with that, uh, to talk a little bit more about a state perspective, uh, Garrett Ucolito, who is the Undersecretary for Transportation uh, at Connecticut's version of OMB, that is the Office of Policy and Management. Garrett? Thanks, Simo. Uh, so Connecticut is kind of in the situation that many other states are in. Uh, we have an aging infrastructure, we have congested roads, we have crowded transit systems. At the same time, we're continuing to have 
uh, our revenue stream for transportation uh, going down and down, largely due to the decline of the gas tax and uh, uh, the decline in oil prices. Uh, deficient and congested roads in Connecticut cost our drivers around $5.1 billion a year. Uh, and transportation is continuing to be one of the largest um, issues for corporations when they're looking to relocate. Uh, we're stuck between uh, New England and New York. Uh, we're a throughput for a lot of traffic. We have major highways, I-95 and I-84, which cut through. We have the nation's busiest commuter rail line, Metro North. Uh, so transportation is really integral to our economic success. Um, Connecticut's uh, transportation systems are paid for two ways. Our capital projects are paid for through largely through bonding. Uh, we have around $600 million a year in bond authorizations for transportation. It's gone up a little bit in the past few years. And we have a federal apportionment. And then we have a special transportation fund, which is uh, filled with money from motor fuels tax, uh, gross receipts tax and petroleum products motor vehicle receipts, such as licenses and registrations. That transportation fund, what we call our SCF, pays for the operations of our DOT and our DMV. It pays for the uh, personnel costs. It pays for the debt service for our capital projects. Uh, so as we've seen cars become more fuel efficient, as oil prices have uh, plummeted, our special transportation fund has suffered in recent years. And Connecticut has done what I would say, where people say the federal government has done, is we've taken money from our general fund and put it into our transportation fund to try and flood the holes. Uh, in 2015, Governor Malloy recognized that uh, we needed to make major um, improvements to our transportation system to keep our state economically competitive uh, with other states and, and with companies around the world. So he introduced a 30-year transportation plan known as Let's Go CT. It's $100 billion. Uh, Two-thirds of that is just preservation and safety projects. Um, uh, it's an attempt to address uh, the single largest economic um, issue in our state, which is transportation. Uh, he, that same year, in 2015, secured legislative approval for two big transportation pro uh, initiatives. One is a uh, five-year bond authorization for an extra $2.8 billion. That's on top of our annual transportation bonding program. Uh, he also secured a transfer of 0.5% of our sales tax from the general fund to the transportation fund. And that uh, is keeping our transportation fund afloat up through the year uh, fiscal year 2020. So it bought us some time to try and find a a more permanent solution to our transportation funding needs. Um, however, the continuous deficits in our transportation fund, which I know many other states are facing, has forced Connecticut to begin to use the word that has traditionally not been spoken in our state, which is tolls. I can't think of anything more controversial in Connecticut um, in the past 20 or 30 years than tolling itself. Um, tolls were in Connecticut um, in the past. We were one of those states that were grandfathered in. Uh, we had the Connecticut Turnpike, um, which became I-95, which had tolls on it. We had tolls on our bridges and on uh, a couple of our parkways. However, in 1983, there was a horrific accident at a toll plaza in Stratford, Connecticut. Uh, and following that, Connecticut began the process of dismantling our tolling infrastructure. Uh, we worked with Federal Highway to um, get approvals to incorporate the mileage for our Connecticut Turnpike into our apportionment um, so that we would not uh, lose revenue uh, by getting rid of our tolls. And by the end of the 1980s, tolls were completely removed from Connecticut um, off of our highways, bridges, and parkways. Um, since then, we've relied on gas tax and, and oil companies tax and other motor vehicle receipts but with major projects on the horizon, including a $6 billion project in Hartford and a $10 billion project in Waterbury, uh, both of those on I-84, uh, Connecticut is facing serious um, questions about how we're going to be able to move forward with those projects and 
simple preservation and safety projects that we need to do. Uh, so back in 2011, Connecticut DOT applied to federal government to be one of those states under the Value Pricing Pilot Program. In 2015, we completed the studies um, and submitted them to the federal government. Uh, this is for both I-95 and I-84. Um, however, Connecticut does not have the legislative authority to do tolling today. Um, if Connecticut DOT um, wanted to pursue tolling and thought it was a good idea um, to help uh, mitigate congestion on our roads and to pay for some uh, rehabilitation and reconstruction of those projects I, I mentioned previously, we would need statutory changes to Connecticut's uh, laws. Um, so prior to this year, if you would ask me if we would ever be actually discussing tolling in Connecticut, um, I could probably count on one hand the number of legislators who were supportive of tolling. Uh, the, the chairman of our transportation committee has long been a proponent because um, he's, he's seen the, the coming problems in our transportation fund and the aging infrastructure. Um, but this year, um, that chairman of our transportation committee actually pushed through his committee for the first time a bill that would authorize tolling. And it's, it's a waiting action in the House of Representatives in Connecticut. You have the Speaker of the House, um, the Majority Leader of the House, and the Senate President, all of them um, saying that tolling is essentially inevitable in Connecticut and it's something we should pursue. Um, uh, no one could have foreseen that prior to this year. Uh, we still have significant opposition in Connecticut to tolling. Um, the public continues to think of toll plazas and, and backups that they used to experience on our highways when we had tolls or that they'd experience when they used to take the mass pike, um, they would experience those backups or lots of the bridges in New York. Those are our experiences in Connecticut. Now I think with Massachusetts converting, converting open to open road tolling, um, electronic tolling, uh, New York beginning that process too, I think people in Connecticut are beginning to see that that is what we're talking about when we talk about tolling. Um, the House and Senate Republicans in Connecticut as well, as well as the trucking industry in Connecticut continue to lead serious opposition to tolling. Um, uh, opponents continue to raise some arguments such as there's no evidence that revenue will be raised by tolling, um, diversion will cripple our local roads, and that we need to do a study first before we authorize tolling to determine where we put the gantry, gantries and, and how much the tolls would cost. Um, so at this point, uh, we have two and a half, three weeks left in our legislative session in Connecticut. It's unclear uh, what uh, will happen. Uh, there is a lot of support in the General Assembly, much more than we've ever experienced on tolling. Um, but it still needs to be an education process for legislators and the public, especially to point out, as others have said, tolling is not about um, you know, program financing, it's about project financing. It's allowing states to execute projects we wouldn't be able to do ourselves. Um, Connecticut uh, can't go out and bond $10 billion to do one project. Uh, that would essentially eat up all of our project funding for years and years and years. And we have to put lots of things by the wayside and the debt service loan would, would cripple all transportation funds. So um, what's clear at this point is that Connecticut needs to either find new ways to finance projects, whether it's through tolls, new gas taxes, or moving existing taxes into the transportation fund, or we have to scale back um, our aspirations for our trans transportation infrastructure or uh, on the other hand, reduce the operational costs um, that eat into our revenue, which means service reductions on our, our impressively busy uh, rail line and bus systems. So that's the status of Connecticut right now. Well, that's great. So um, those, were, those were some great introductory remarks. I know we're taking questions through the chat function on the, uh, on the webinar website. So we're going to have the questions going to be brought over to us. Um, so go ahead and feel free to, 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 to send those in. In the meantime, I want to start with just one, just to, to clarify something, Karen. You, you mentioned that the, 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 the tolling proposals in the state are highly controversial. Can you summarize where the controversy is coming from and how you address those major concerns? Yeah, I think a lot of people um, have seen in the past uh, potential efforts to take money out of the transportation fund and put it in the general fund. 
even though we traditionally have been doing the opposite, which is putting money from the general fund into the transportation fund, I don't think um, many people in Connecticut recognize that fact. Uh, so they, there have been occasions in the past uh, 20 years or so where the legislature and, and governors have uh, raided the transportation fund to plug holes in the general fund. But generally, it's been the reverse, where we plug the holes in the transportation fund. So people are skeptical of us raise, raising new revenue for transportation when they think we have enough revenue already. And uh, they think that if we just do this, it's just me, another tax, another burden, when in reality, we just need to live within our means. I don't think they realize the massive infrastructure projects. $10 billion is almost something we can't, we've never done a project that large in Connecticut, let alone $6 billion or, or $4 billion. So. And there's one thing, actually, I, I want to get on the table just for, uh, for maybe folks uh, who are watching the same questions. You mentioned that the state can actually do this now if it wants to. It just needs legislative support on the state level. And maybe Jeff, you know this. So, so what is the question to the federal government right now? What, what, is, what, is the, what is the federal kind of leverage point right here? If states can do it right now, and if there are no restrictions, what is the, what's the question that's really they can, this? They can, states can do it through pilot applying through one or another of the pilot programs. And they, Connecticut is one state that has a plan. Connecticut has in one, through one of those pilot programs, and Jeff mentioned uh, some others. There are a couple of others as well, not all of which have been fully utilized, but nonetheless. So there's an application process. There's also a process of having to reach under one or another of these pilot programs if you actually impose the tolls after doing the study of having to reach an agreement, a so-called tolling agreement, with the Federal Highway Administration. It seems to be a process which going back now almost 10 you know 10 years in the bush administration we just felt the process ought to be eliminated and there's a lot of talk now about you know reducing regulation uh, uh streamlining the processes for projects and i think this is very consistent with it it should our view as i said at that time was this this really should be mainstream that if a state wanted to move forward they shouldn't have to go through an application process Agreement pro negotiation and agreement process, they should be able to just move forward under under conditions. I mean that which could be introduced in the federal law, making sure that there are appropriate conditions on the imposition of tolling. But it should be without all of the, the bureaucratic burdens that exist today. There's actually a related question that's coming from one of the one of the viewers. Is there actually is there a stronger federal role that, that the federal government can play? Is there something other than just relaxing the restrictions? Are folks calling for there to be more aggressive federal in any of this? Or is this this removing the restrictions? Is that basically the baseline? Well, again, going back to our thinking you now 10 years ago, which is not, and, and obviously been other efforts since that time, uh, I think it was viewed as to be permissive. Uh, I think uh, there is a sense, and it gets us, maybe, and maybe it's tangential to this discussion, but I know there is some view that those states that do more, that is, pay more, should be rewarded, uh, should receive bonuses or benefits. States, you know, for example, like California, which has self-help legislation where they dedicate sales taxes, uh, should they get the benefit of more federal funding than they would otherwise be apportioned because they're doing more on their own? One could imagine that there could be a similar uh, program of incentives that could apply not only to the introduction of tolling, but the introduction of revenue streams that allow states to move forward in rebuilding their transportation infrastructure. To, to the extent that the Trump infrastructure plan is going to be so heavily about leveraging financing as opposed to actual federal check writing funding, uh, it's implicitly biased towards projects that could produce a revenue stream and implicitly biased, therefore, towards toll facilities. Uh, where, where applicable. So, uh, but it, it, but it would only do, you, you can't do much good with that unless you also loosen federal restrictions onto it. And then, so maybe a related question to that, I think for Pat. Um, someone wants to know, so there are, so private toll road companies are very common in other countries. Um, not so much here, I guess, in the U.S. maybe internationally, but what, what are the advantages or disadvantages uh, for the U.S. And, and with private versus public toll road companies? It's a very good question, and, and I would say there isn't a, a particular advantage to having a toll facility that, that is privately operated or operated by an organ of the state, whether it's a, a 
commission or, or an authority. But where we're starting to see uh, private enterprises get involved in tolling is in urban areas with managed lanes, where uh, they're using the existing facility or expanding the existing facility to create a price managed lane, to use uh, the, the price of the toll, to vary the price of the toll uh, during peak congestion periods to uh, drive traffic off the system when the congestion is high. Uh, I think several of the firms that are involved in the United States today have, have demonstrated you know, very good capability to do that. So I think uh, we may see some US-based firms getting into that business, but for now it, it's tended to be uh, the uh, Australian, Spanish, French, other firms uh, that are involved. Do you see cities actually taking a lead role in any of this? And we talked about it, the federal government and the states, but I think you're exactly right. I mean, the cities are trying to deal with some of these congestion challenges very differently. They're not really in this federalist kind of frame, but are they, are they players in this? I, I think it's possible for cities to be players in this. I think up to this point, we've seen mostly uh, state DOTs being players, and, uh, or, or maybe even at the, at the county level. But I, I do see a possibility for cities getting involved. And they could become involved, I think, through, you know, the PATS membership. I mean, toll authorities, you think about organizations like MTA and what, what is today MTA's bridge and tunnel uh, division, if you will, which was the Trevor Bridge and Tunnel Authority. Uh, so you can imagine uh, entities like that. But as Jeff pointed out, and as we acknowledge, you go back to the beginnings of the federal aid highway program was federal aid to the states and these facilities particularly talking about interstate highways are owned managed operated by the states so i think that tends to lead us to a focus on uh, permissiveness if you will in terms of this the state toolbox for rebuilding assets that they own they may be impacted by it but the, right. the, right. the decision made too much state um, questions about, the, about the, the trucking industry and their concerns. The, we do hear that um, they will go out of their way to avoid some of the tolls, given some of their the, the, the margins are kind of thin. Are there responses? How do you deal with this, with the, the, of the, the, the shift into other roads that aren't tolled that, the, that keep coming up with the truck? Well, I mean, I, I think I mean, the diversion issue is an important and relevant issue. Uh, and you know, let's let's face it. I mean, the use of tolls or any kind of pricing mechanism, mileage-based pricing or, or vehicle miles traveled, is does have an influence on demand. That is, uh, who uses a facility, how they use the facility, when they use the facility. Um, so we should recognize that there will be some impact. Uh, I think, and I, you know, this is something for the trucking industry to speak to. And Rob, you mentioned the the. The discussion that Pat had with General, with Governor Graves now three or so years ago, um, and uh, it is you know thin margins, but nonetheless there's a weighing of factors here. That is, if you if tolls are introduced and it frees up the flow of traffic on uh, major interstate highways, particularly in urbanized areas, uh, there are savings to the trucking industry and to the shippers who use it, uh, just in terms of reliable, more reliable deliveries. Uh, faster travel times, the ability to use their assets and equipment more uh, efficiently. So there are trade-offs here, uh, and uh, others can speak to that better than I. But I don't think it's as as simple as really just saying, "Hey, this is an added cost, or could be an added cost to an industry or individuals, and therefore should be discarded." Just to add a pick up on what Emil said, I think the trucking industry, most uh, highly professional public and even private trucking companies have developed systems to manage their costs and know where they're going to operate effectively and profitably. Uh, I think the, the added question for this is what is the cost of not acting? What is the cost of continuing to have deficits and, and gaps in the infrastructure that we need? How degraded do the roads and the highway system, especially the interstate highway system, how degraded does it become? And that becomes a bigger cost for the freight industry, for the trucking industry, than paying the tolls. Uh, we've heard from the trucking industry that they're supportive of, of uh, tolling new capacity, but not existing capacity. 
I think Jeff made a, a really good point about uh, thinking of our, of our highway facilities as an asset with a depreciating value. And when the value of that asset depreciates enough, you're not talking about uh, paying again for the same facility. You're talking about rebuilding the facility. There was a question that came up, maybe this related, Jeff, this may be a Can we use this total conversation to better inform highway cost allocation studies? Um, possibly. Uh, yeah, the, I'm kind of disappointed that Congress hasn't done a, ordered a comprehensive new cost allocation study in quite some time. And largely that's because of the debate over the role the very heaviest trucks play in disproportional uh, wear and tear on roads. Uh, if you look at the, the last time Congress raised the gas tax for highways in 1982, they had a fresh cost allocation study from Treasury and they and the, the tax system they set up was designed to evenly allocate small cars versus light trucks versus heavy, heavy trucks versus super heavy trucks uh, and the costs they incur. Uh, and the owner operators rioted literally uh, in 1983 and that the the suit that the heavy the tax on the heaviest trucks, the HVUT, was too much for them. And so Congress eventually gave in and lower the HVUT and then raise the diesel tax by six cents to make up the lost revenue. So which is why diesel is more is, is tax heavier. But uh, and the HVUT hasn't been raised since it's like five hundred and fifty bucks a year, I think, no matter how you know how heavy the truck is or how much you use it. So uh, in I, I get the sense that certain elements actively don't want another adequate an accurate cost allocation study because of the way it uh, would it would require Jacking up the HVUT on super heavy trucks if you want to have a fair allocation. It's probably politically common. Yeah, right. Maybe credit Gary, credit for you or for other folks too. We talked about the, um, the potential impact of tolls on low income populations. I'm curious if this is coming up in, in Connecticut at all. I mean, clearly this is maybe some kind of grassroots um, kind of element to it. But then if it is, then are there ways of being addressed? Maybe how, the, how do you address the disproportionate impact that might have on low income? So that issue has uh, partially come up in Connecticut. The, the main focus in Connecticut has been the impact on residents. Um, and uh, a lot of people in, in the General Assembly in Connecticut have talked about how we have a significant portion of people just driving through our state, not stopping, not buying gas, not buying, even stopping at our service plazas. Because we're a small state, you can get from uh, New Jersey to Massachusetts quickly without stopping in Connecticut. Um, you know, flip through New York and Rhode Island. Um, but one issue that has come up in it, which actually is addressed in the legislation in Connecticut, is that it directs the Department of Transportation to come up with a um, system to discount or provide credits for a residents of Connecticut. Now, I, I, I know that's uh, tricky. Um, we have seen, we've been told by other states that they do if you have an easy pass or a transponder from their state, they get this kind of rate from if you have from their state. Doesn't mean you're a resident of that state, but it's just the transponder from that state. So that's been a lot of the discussion in Connecticut. Another discussion, another idea that's been raised is providing actually an income tax credit for people in Connecticut based on how much they use the tolls. Um, so that's one way we potentially address that. Um, the legislation is not really prescriptive, but it does direct the department to come up with some ideas to help alleviate the burden on residents. So. It, it, it's also true that the, at least one of the pilot programs, the value of pricing pilot program, uh, does allow, if not require, and I've forgotten myself, uh, the utilization of revenues from the tolls to, if you will, alleviate the burden on low income, uh, uh, low income drivers and users of the facility. Uh, the difficulty with that is that, as Garrett mentioned, uh, and others, that when you look at this, that this is, the tolling is really most significant, I think, in terms of the capital costs of rebuilding the interstate system, and that oftentimes there's not enough surplus, if you will, from uh, the toll revenues alone to be utilized for other purposes. That, of course, I mean, that's another subject. There is concern on people who oppose uh, the imposition of tolls that they will be used, even within the transportation sector, 
that people are using a highway facility will be subsidizing transit, for example. And um, that, that is also a controversial feature you know, in most places, to some degree in Connecticut, but I'm sure true generally in the discussion of our topic. I want to stay on the question of uh, the impact on low-income families and individuals. There was a, an opinion piece in the New York Times that some of our viewers may have seen that really uh, attacked the whole notion of price-managed lanes. And there were a lot of holes in the arguments there. And, and chief among them, you know, uh, with, with low-income individuals, they are uh, going to feel much more uh, affected by a lot of sectors of our economy, whether it be transportation, housing, uh, food, health care. They are going to pay a larger percentage of their income for all of those kinds of things. And I think it's unfair to try to rectify that situation by placing all of the burden on the transportation industry. But the other thing I would add is that in the case of price managed lanes, uh, on SR91 in California, the 91 express lanes, they've conducted a number of studies over the years and found that people of all income categories are very supportive of the 91 express lanes because when they absolutely positively have to get somewhere, even low income individuals will choose to use the lanes because of the trip reliability and the fact that it helps them get, you know, spend more time with their families. But then, or, to Timo's point, that this issue of then of using toll revenue for other transportation sources, you know, the cash calification, I've heard that used that term. How much of a problem is, is that? Is that what's happening now? Are, are tolls being used for other areas of the system? I think this is kind of at the heart of what's the concern about the Rhode Island proposal, for example. Is that right? Well, I, I, I think it is a fear, but I'm not sure how much it, it really is the case. I mean, that was, that came up, you remember, uh, I think it was Interstate 70 or 80, I can't understand, 80, I think, in, in Pennsylvania, where, uh, quite frankly, and I don't think I'm uh, misrepresenting Governor Rend then Governor Rendell's position, is that he hoped to utilize the privatization of those facilities, the imposition of tolls, to support the transit systems both in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Uh, as it, it turned out, the, the application to the federal government for the, was rejected as it not consistent uh, at the time with federal law. Uh, whether that really would have been possible is quite another question. I think the, the, the evidence in most cases, as I, as I indicated, is that it really doesn't. I was involved, uh, as Garrett knows, with a study a couple of years ago, a year or two ago, for Governor Malloy in Connecticut on transportation financing, those really transportation funding. And uh, the toll revenues that we estimated or projected would, or the tolls that would be imposed, didn't even produce enough. They made a significant contribution to the capital cost of rebuilding the facilities that Garrett made reference to. Uh, they, those facilities could not be rebuilt without the contribution of toll revenues, but it didn't leave a lot of extra money for subsidizing other parts of the transportation system. Yeah, maybe a question for you. There's, there's a couple of these that have come up, maybe unfair, but uh, any any thoughts on the odds of, of success in, in Connecticut or that there may be some kind of uh, change, in the, change in the rules? Uh, you know, uh, it's a very interesting year in Connecticut. We, I think, as with some of our other neighboring states, we, we're suffering from a, a significant budget uh, situation. Uh, so I think first we need to get through our budget uh, resolution, uh, and I think of any year this is the year we might see tolls pass out of the, the state house, uh, and then it has to go to the state senate, um, where it may uh, face a tougher battle. The, the, our state senate is split 50-50 right now, so our lieutenant governor is the deciding factor in any uh, tie votes, so um, that assumes that all of one caucus supports it, which we're not, um, I don't think anyone's done any vote counting yet in the Senate. So. Are there other states that you're, that you're looking at for, for models, or are the other states dealing with the same thing? You all, you all talk at the various conferences and things. And are there any other states that you think you should pay attention to? Yeah. We're, we're, we're looking at what's happening in Rhode Island. Um, we're looking at what happen, what's happening all across the country. Uh, we keep seeing reports a monthly or, or every few months about other states raising their gas taxes or increasing fees. We've seen what's happened in California and others um, uh, all across the country. So, you know, legislators in Connecticut are paying attention and realizing that 
you know, we're not unique in this situation. Other, every other state seems to be in the same situation where transportation needs new revenue streams in order to, to continue to thrive. I, I would say also that the uh, Pat made references the technology makes it easier. I think uh, uh, I was at a legislative hearing in Connecticut at which the commissioner of highways in Massachusetts came down and talked about the open road electronic tolling they had just introduced on the Massachusetts Turnpike. I think it made a real impact on the legislators to, to finally begin to move away from this image they have, as, as Garrett mentioned, of toll plazas, lines, baskets, throwing coins in the baskets, uh, and all the safety and environmental considerations. I think they understood that that was not really, that was not relevant at all. And I think that was a big factor as well as the financial and funding issues. Are we moving toward, I mean, you have to be moving towards more interoperability on toll. I mean, we have easy pass across the Northeast Corridor. I had someone complain to me that they have to going to pass for Florida than they do for the North. But we have to be moving towards more interoperability. This has been one of the commitments of IBTTA for the last seven years. We've been working on this since uh, 2010, and uh, we're rapidly moving toward uh, nationwide interoperability through testing that we're doing and rationalizing business rules across all the different regions of interoperability. And I think that is a role uh, for the federal government, even in a permissive situation, saying, you know, you don't have to do this, but if you do it, there should be compatibility and interoperability. And I think the federal government tries to play a role in that, but I think it can be even more aggressive, frankly, in assuring that. Was that the federal government at the time that was promoting? Is that what we have? Uh, you mean with, it, with easy interoperability, pass? for example? Uh, I think that was more a function. It's my impression that it was really more a function of States themselves come to agreements through things like the I-95 Quarter Coalition, for example. And little by little, the Easy Pass, for example, has extended its reach from, I think, Pat now yeah. Maine to Illinois to Eastern North Carolina. 15 states, 38 agencies. Right. Yeah. One more question. I think this, this is a Jeff question. Can you repeat where the federal law on tolling the interstates is prohibited? I think we have a couple of questions of folks trying to get exactly at this negative. We have no critical. The overall toll ban is Section 301 of Title 23 United States Code. And then there are a whole bunch of exceptions in Section 127 that, uh, so there, there are, the 127 is the exceptions and 301 is the general ban. Well, we're just about out of time. I'll turn it over to just a minute, but I want to thank everybody for, for taking the time um, to, to, to sign up. We had a lot of great questions, a lot that we couldn't get to. Um, we're going to stay involved in this issue with email. I know IBTTA is going to stay involved in this issue. I thought we raised a lot of important uh, questions and, and concerns here today. Um, well, we solved anything. This is clearly not going away anytime soon. But given the large challenges that we're facing on infrastructure, um, given the need to experiment and for innovation that's happening in cities and states all across the country, we know that places are looking at one another for new ideas. This is clearly an idea that's on the table. It's clearly an idea that has some things to be worked out. But we're really happy to participate uh, in this conversation uh, and raise some of those. Thanks again, Pat. Rob, thank you for those comments and to all the participants on the panel. I thought it was great. I thought we did raise a lot of great issues. You can visit us online at ibtta.org and at enotrans.org. And uh, we look forward to seeing you down the road. Thank you very much.